Welcome. I'm Dr. Alicia Cohen. I'm the director of the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Minnesota. Thank you for joining us tonight for a frank discussion about journalism, race, and representation in the news media. We'll discuss the challenges and dangers that journalists face when, for example, approaching police during protests or with working with narratives about race and racism in the newsroom. We'll use examples of what has gone well with recent coverage and how last summer's civil unrest changed or perhaps didn't change how we talk about race. Together with the panelists, we will explore what we learned from the last year to help newsrooms prepare for the future. Before I begin our conversation, I want to express our thoughts with our friends and colleagues in Texas and elsewhere in the United States who've lost power. We are fortunate in Minnesota to be well prepared for the cold weather that we're experiencing tonight. And I'm delighted to have the panelists here tonight in virtual Murphy Hall. Um, and I appreciate their willingness to join me this evening. First, allow me to introduce each of them to you. Kendall Harkness has started her new role as assisting, Assistant Managing Editor of Diversity and Community at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Before stepping into this job, Harkness was a photo editor. She was coordinating coverage of the Ryder Cup, two Olympics, and the Super Bowl Final Four and breaking news such as Prince's deaths and occupations and protests after police shootings. Before becoming an editor, Kendall spent more than two decades as a photojournalist working for 15 years at the Star Tribune, covering communities across the state. She's also taught as a photo instructor at high school journalism camp called J Camp for 15 years and at Champions a Diversity of Voices. Kendall is truly a part of the sandwich generation, living both with her son who's 10 and her mother who is 83. Omar Jimenez also joins us tonight. He is CNN correspondent based in Chicago, where he primarily covers the Midwest for the network. He's reported extensively on the COVID-19 pandemic, dating all the way back to the first reported US death at the time in Kirkland, Washington. In Minneapolis, he and his team were cuffed and detained by Minnesota State Patrol while reporting on protests in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. He is the recipient of multiple awards and honors, including being named to Forbes' latest 30 under 30 class in the category of media. Jimenez graduated from the Medill School of Journalism down the road at Northwestern University, where he also played on the varsity men's basketball team. Finally, Danielle Kilgo is the John and Elizabeth Bates Coles Professor of Journalism, Diversity and Equality at the Hubbard School. She researches media's contribution to uneven power dynamics and diversity issues in society. Her dozens of publications explore news narratives and public engagement and includes a major focus of police violence, social inequalities, and social movements against violence and racism. Her work has won multiple awards, including the 2020 Lillian Lodge Coppenhaver Outstanding Early Career Woman Scholar Award and the 2018 AEJMC Emerging Scholar Grant. Kilgo currently teaches about diversity, media, mass uh, uh, identity, and mass communication in the school. She's earned her BA and MA in Journalism and Public Relations from Baylor University and her PhD in Journalism from the University of Texas at Austin. We're delighted to have Danielle here. She joined our school this past year during the pandemic. Um, and we had hiring conversations. We had no idea what was about to emerge really in the past year, and she's been a wonderful contributor. As a moderator of this event, I need to go over a few logistics for all of our audience members so you all know how you can participate. First, please know that this is a secure webinar that is being recorded. We plan to upload the recording to our website to share it with others so you can go back and refer, refer to it. Second, our panelists will talk tonight for about 30 minutes, ask, answering some questions that I have prepared for them in advance. However, we do plan on answering questions that you might have for them. You may ask questions by typing them in the Q&A box that you might find at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you look down by participants, um, you'll see the Q&A box, click on it and type your question to the panelists. You can do so by your name or anonymously, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. You will note also that there's no chat function available as we want to focus our on the questions that you have for our panelists here tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to throw my first question out to the panelists. First, a broad multifaceted question that each of you might respond to. Perhaps Kendall, you might um, want to respond first. Um, what went right, do you think, in coverage of the uprisings, race and racism most recently in the Twin City, particularly in the past year? 
what went wrong? Uh, what's one piece of practical advice that you would offer to journalists who are preparing for coverage of the upcoming trials that we have here coming up in a few weeks? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll take that first one. Um, I think that um, I'll sort of answer them all sort of collectively. I think that it's important that we, um, when we think about the upcoming trial, and um, and we think about this summer, I think what we need to make sure that we're doing is um, really making sure that we're telling the very complex and um, the making sure that we have the, the complexity around all of the stories, not just uh, not just the trial, but um, who is affected by the trial. This is gonna be the first time in Minnesota that uh, a trial of this magnitude is gonna be live streamed. And so the average person has a chance to watch what's happening. Um, so as journalists, I think it's our responsibility to uh, prepare the folks who are gonna be seeing this, which is everyone, and how do we prepare them? Um, what does this mean in communities of color um, that are going to be watching or not watching? Um, there's so many, it's a multifaceted uh, type of coverage that we're looking for. Um, I think it's really important that we are going beyond just reporting on the trial day by day, because I think that's, you know, that's, that's that surface piece. Um, I think what we've learned over time is that um, really making sure that we are getting community voices um, in, uh, in what we do to make sure that uh, there is that complexity of narrative uh, that's different than what we've experienced before. Omar, do you wanna hop in? Um... Yeah, what, yeah. What are some of your thoughts then? You've watched the coverage from both the national perspective as well as um, had your eye on the Midwest and the Twin Cities for some time. For sure. I, I think when you go back to uh, at least part of your question about what went right during uh, during the coverage, it's actually I think that that's a harder question to to answer than than I think some of than in some ways what went wrong. Um, in, in the sense of, obviously, this was a situation that from a public safety perspective, those in the city of Minneapolis were not prepared for, for the magnitude of, 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 of turnout that we saw, in some cases violent, in some cases not, but just the magnitude of how this story was going to impact people across the world um, and the emotions it was going to stir in the, uh, in the community there. So public safety, I think, was caught off guard. And then I think from a media perspective, I think this really exposed um, the weaknesses in many, in many different publications about gaps in their coverage, about being very focused on the day-to-day -day of the protests of, hey, look, a protest is happening here. Hey, look, a protest is happening there. But kind of this was maybe the highest profile moment where now it was being exposed that, well, what are we gaining from this coverage overall? What is going to be the lasting education that people are going to get from watching or reading the coverage that comes out of this? And I think that's when you started to have the conversations about, well, what kind of reporters are covering this? What biases are being brought to the table? What inherently are we missing from this coverage because of who we are sending to this story? Um, and so those conversations were starting to happen. And while they had happened prior, I don't think they had happened on such a high profile story like this before, where there was really no ignoring it, whether you're CNN, whether you're New York Times, whether you're the, you're the Star Tribune. Um, I think there was so much attention on this that now all of a sudden, these. Uh, we saw it play out the corporate structure outside of journalism. There was all this pressure for journalism, for uh, media companies, and for even uh, consumer brands to change um, with whatever the wider message was that was being sent from um, from the story. And Danielle, you've you've uh, studied many police-involved shootings and social movement protests. 
what was different about the coverage in this context and what, what did you see that went well and, and what were you searching for in the coverage? Yeah, I mean, in the first couple of days, it seemed pretty much like same old, same old, <laughs> like much of like what I've seen in other protests uh, that have happened in Ferguson, that have happened in Baltimore. Um, but then it, it did shift. And I think a lot of it was journalists, um, you know, getting hurt, journalists being willing to have a conversation about what they were reporting, journalists being willing to talk about being arrested, right? Um, I, to have these challenges be front and center, I think, really started a public conversation where journalists could critique both um, the government and the powers that be and themselves, which was really a welcomed uh, entry. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it was really telling um, on May 31st that, you know, Slate made 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 like waves by um, headlining one of their articles that uh, something like police erupt in violence nationwide. I think is is what it read. And the same day, the Star Tribune's front page said the guard moves in and um, massive deployment of massive deployment to quell the rioting or something like that. And you know, just the the stark differences there really made it clear that like we have a long ways to go. Um, and so I think that there uh, were a lot of mistakes that were made that are really just typical of traditional journalism, of, of going to official sources, of being caught off guard by a massive government um, uh, or in military presence, um, but also um, sort of using that as the highlight instead of um, bringing in the voices of the community that surround them. I think there's a lot of people who did do that well. Um, in Minneapolis, many of the alternative organizations that um, sort of bring a different voice to that to our new media ecology, bring some diversity in. Um, so these, I think these places, these different media organizations work together for sure to like sort of bring more breadth to the narrative, um, and maybe that's why we know a little bit more about it. But um, but there was certainly some pitfalls. Um, but I think one of the shining moments for journalists for sure was this shift to think about what the police do during protest, how they instigate protest, um, how that affects protesters. And that was something that I've just not seen before um, in my, my research at a, a large scale and I've seen here in the, the Minneapolis coverage. Let's talk a little bit about the police tactics. Um, Omar, you experienced the protest in Minneapolis firsthand um, as a journalist. You were arrested um, by the um, state police while reporting last summer. And what are some challenges that journalists face? Um, uh, I mean, and do you think that that arrest had something to do with the shaping of the coverage in the sense that uh, it seemed to me at least that there was a focus on what the tactics um, were, whether it was kettling or um, uh, other tactics involved and, and how those tactics affected reporting um, became part of the, the story as well as um, the drama. So um, what were some of the challenges that you, you faced during this and, and how do you think it affected your reporting? Well, I think whenever, just as reporters, whenever we're deployed to a scene where there's a protest in general, there's a certain set of guidelines, there's a certain mentality you have about, in some ways, you're, you're on your own. You know, as, as much guidance as you can get from those in the field, when you're on the ground there, it oftentimes can be a chaotic scene and you and your teammates are there. You have to watch each other's backs and you report the story. That's kind of the base mentality that we're going into the scenario with. But in all honesty, usually that mentality, or at least before this story, was being applied to, we don't know which type of protesters or people are gonna come. So we gotta watch out for them. Like that was how this was sort of being framed as who, we don't know what crazy person is gonna come and show up and try to attack you, which look, that's not going anywhere, that's always there. But this story was the first time, at least in my journalism experience, where now we had to worry about what the police were gonna do as far as us being safe. Of course, my my being cuffed on live television was maybe the most high profile incident. I mean, not maybe, it was the most high profile incident um, in regards to police interacting um, with reporters on the scene there. But that very next day, um, it, was, it was a Saturday and they, the curfew was getting ready to go into effect in the evening time. And there were all these people still gathered in the street. It was very clear that no one was going to adhere to the curfew, at least the people that were out there. And we were almost wondering, all right, we're approaching where the police, what is going to happen? And it was an eerie silence 
And then about 20 minutes into the actual curfew, again, people just standing around, police literally come marching down the street, just shooting rubber bullets and, and, and tear gas into the crowd willy nilly. Everybody's spreading. Our photographer uh, got shot in the leg with a rubber bullet. His phone completely snapped in half and it ripped a hole in his shorts. Our other photographer got shot in the back as we were leaving. And so now all of a sudden this, this idea of again, safety and this idea of instigation is being flipped on its head firsthand by the coverage that, that we're showing. There's, there's no getting around it. I'm sitting there live on the scene. It's not some crazy protester who came up and shot us with a rubber bullet. It's we are standing here reporting and these officers are now uh, assaulting us in some ways. So, so that, that was maybe the first time I think that it, it, was, it, had, it was forced into the coverage. And even if you missed it one day, guess what? There were three more days in a row where you were going to get reminded about it. And at some point, it was going to make it into your coverage. And then at some point, people were going to see that, oh, that actually is a very big part of what we're seeing unfold in the streets of Minneapolis. Kendall, you're, you know, in addition to working with reporters, you also were editing and trying to, you know, help manage content in this milieu. Can you talk a little bit about you know, as an editor, even in your current position um, as editor for diversity and community, can you tell us more about how your position developed and and how um, how how converse you know how uh, the Star Tribune was thinking about the content um, that was being produced? I of course talked to a lot of your photojournalists um, last summer and others, and and so um, you know every, every single one of them really has a story um, to tell. Um, about the time, about their concern, both for themselves um, and also for um, fairly representing the community that they live in um, and, um, and what that means for them and for their relationship with the community as journalists. And I'm sure that's something that you think about as an editor. Um, how yeah, did it yeah. for you when that became part of the story, the, the part that Omar spoke about? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, uh, you know, we we're all living in these boxes. And so, you know, this was different for us to have to try to um, coordinate everyone and keep it, people safe um, during, a, you know, from our living rooms, basically, right? And um, so it almost felt like, Omar, it almost felt like I was, I was at a television station because I had, you know, TV on and we're in these boxes. Um, uh, we're, we're in our own little situation room um, in our team's meeting where we're just hanging out all night long as uh, we're texting folks in group chats. And, you know, in, uh, we say Minneapolis, but it's also Minneapolis and St. Paul. So 20 minutes apart, uh, you know, stuff would pop um, in Minneapolis and then all of a sudden something would happen in St. Paul so we had to make sure that we got people to places. We had to make sure that they were in, uh, two by two, right? That they had somebody had their back, that no one was left alone. And you know, you have, you have certain photographers who will go in and um, they tend to like to get close. And, um, you know, Richard Song Tatari like went into the target where people were looting and, um, and made images from there. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of us, um, you know, I, I was not so long from being on the street for uh, Jamar Clark and uh, Philando Castile that you can see uh, that there was still that difference, at least partially, where you could stand in between and feel relatively slave. And this was not the case. Um, you know, report after report of um, photographers and reporters being injured um, just became more the norm. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of trying to coordinate to make sure that we were keeping in contact with people and um, making sure that they were safe enough to have safe places to send pictures back from. Um, 
but you know, in the room where we're looking at images and deciding on headlines and 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 picking things out, um, uh, there were some tough conversations about images, about what we should show. Um, the photographers were talking about making sure that they weren't being stereotypical in the images uh, that they were producing, and and we were really being fairly conscious about that um, uh, when we were talking about putting things in print. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example with um, um, the frame grab of, um, of Chauvin and um, uh, George Floyd. Um, we talked about we talked about the merits of running something like that. Do we need to see it as a as a part of our print product? And um, so you know, there's there's a good thing that I was in the room. So sometimes I miss being out on the street and doing doing the work, but there is there's power to having people who look differently and think differently to be in those rooms when you can say, you know, I don't feel comfortable with having that picture in the paper at all. Like I think it's traumatizing for people who look like me to see that and have that as a hard copy. Um, and so we were able to discuss it and have a moment to like really talk about the merits of it and people can went back and forth and um, you know, eventually that did not run in the paper. And um, that felt like a, a, a win in my, a, a win in our part. Um, but yeah, like uh, just as Omar, Omar was saying and uh, Danny was saying too, like the, the summer was a moment for us to really look inward about who is covering communities, what that looks like um, and how can we do better? And um, so, you know, the Star Tribune went through their own reckoning over the summer just to talk about, um, how we need to change as a group of journalists. And um, so the journalists of color in our, in our shop got together and came up with some solutions and presented that to, um, to the editors and to the publisher. And that's kind of how my job came along. Like one of the things that we needed to have was like one person who is the accountability police, right? In our newsroom that can go and say, yeah, do we really want to do that? Or mm, I'm not quite sure if that, like, are you really talking to people? You know, how, you know, getting at the complexity of what we do and creating structures that help us see each other better and then represent the community better because we see each other better. And um, so I feel very, um, uh, I'm glad that I get to be able to do this work. I mean, there's so much to do um, but yeah, that's how it came about. We were just looking around and going, yeah, this is not right. And, and so we took steps to make, uh, to make that kind of change. Danny, you've studied, uh, uh, you know, studied this phenomena for a number of years. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how, um, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll lease in a, a question from um, the audience. Ruth DeFoster, who's on our faculty, um, has written a question. One of the most consistently unjust and frustrating aspects of the problem of um, with police brutality is that offers, officers are almost never even charged with crimes following extrajudicial killings, let alone convicted. How can journalists begin to cover systemic, systemic <laughs> sorry, systemic institutional problems of this magnitude, telling the big story rather than individual um, vignettes. And I know in your own work, you've, um, you've talked about the structures of the co coverage and the difference between some of the episodic um, vignette focused coverage and other models of reporting. Um, what do you see in this coverage and you know, how, what are some practical recommendations um, that, that you've made in your own research for how journalism um, practice could be improved? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that is incredibly frustrating how many um, police officers are, are acquitted or not indicted at all. And um, it's a challenge that journalists, I mean, journalists can't change what the court system does, but I think that, you know, a lot of 
what what the coverage does for protesters is reinforces the status quo. It it basically by giving officials and police the the sort of elevated stance on a regular basis, that coverage has reinforced the government stance or the police stance or the the DA stance, and um, that's sort of what the patterns look like <laughs> over time. Um, especially since I've started researching this um, with the protests that that um, follow the death of Trayvon Martin. Um, what I think has to happen is that this attention to police um, violence, this attention to police presence in certain communities and lack of presence in other communities um, has to be regularly covered before it becomes an event again. It will be an event again, there is no doubt about it. We have not revolutionized policing in America. And so this will happen again. And I think that the conversation has to be has to be on the forefront of people's minds, thinking about both, you know, the the nuance of how crime is, why crime is what crime is, where crime happens and the history behind that. Um, and also, you know, how policing hasn't changed or has changed. Many people think that the the police have been defunded because many headlines said that protesters wanted that, right? But the police have not been defunded. And that's not really that exciting to headline on a regular basis. Unfortunately, most people don't read a lot of headlines. So I would say, put, hey, police not defunded back up in the headlines. <laughs> that would be great. Um, but I think that, you know, we have to reimagine the newsworthiness standards. Like there are amazing things that are newsworthy and sensational and there's conflict and there's drama. And the, yes, that, re that draws people in and fills the capitalistic model of media. But this democratic model of media requires us to sort of take that back for a second and said, ethically, what do people need to know to know, to know that certain communities are still not being served, to know that certain people are still being oppressed, and to know that there are still huge problems, huge gaps that will continue to see these, you know, very disruptive, meet these very disruptive ends to, to for lack of a better word, um, if we don't begin to address them. So I think that really we have to like merge this. Yes, it's not a great business model to maybe headline more boring things, but it is most definitely the way back to get to having the medias play a, a positive role in democracy. Omar, when you think about um, your experience um, covering um, the unrest and protests and uh, how has, um, Com had well first has conversations in your newsroom changed um, discernibly from the time you began to um, you know the path over the past year, and um, do you think um, that this has influenced or affected the types of stories um, that your newsroom has produced or how it's covered subsequent um, protests? Um, it was just the beginning, uh, right, um, in Minneapolis yeah. this past summer. Yeah, yeah. It, it actually, there there are a few concrete changes, and then there are a few things conceptually that have changed. Um, one, I mean, the most concrete one was actually this was something that I think was in development for a few years, softly. But I think the George Floyd protest really pushed it over the edge as we created a race and policing team. So now it's a dedicated team of reporters. That's all they do, um, and we hire new reporters. We shifted around new reporters, and at the very least, just having their stories being pitched into the meetings and seeing the stories that they're bringing to the table that are being published on a daily basis has changed a lot because now there's no excuse to not at least have someone paying attention to to the ongoing crisis in certain communities i mean chicago it's it's always people are still getting shot just because i'm not doing a story on it um i mean chicago had one of its most violent years last year um despite everybody supposedly being home and how do you tell that? I did one story about the intersection of COVID uh, and, and how it relates to the violence that we've seen just because of so many different aspects of society that have been um, that have been disrupted as a result of this. But that in some ways was me pitching that. And then you have this team that is constantly pitching as well. And so again, just having that voice is something that I think has been, um, has been a concrete change. Now, uh, conceptually, I think there's this um, there's this idea that you know in conversations I had with my managers, I can't speak for the whole company in this, but at least with my managers, um, is about this idea of of what bias is, 
where, you know, I think the, the idealistic person is like, oh, you know, I don't want my reporter to have a bias. I don't want, I want my reporter to be straight down the line, straight down the middle. Honestly, there's not a single reporter out there that does not have bias. And I think finally coming to terms with that realization is something that I think all of us need to get on the same page with. That doesn't mean you go out and you just report things that are incorrect or report things that are incredibly swayed to one viewpoint or another. It's just acknowledging the fact that I come from a certain set of backgrounds. I come from a certain uh, set of circumstances that are going to make me inherently view a story in a different lens than someone else. And so conceptually, I think the change was before, while I might have strayed away from that, now it's more, let's lean into that. And what can you personally bring to your professional reporting experience that'll help you tell a more complete story as opposed to just look over here, this happened, look over there, that happened. What can you add contextually to help the audience understand? If you were telling a story at a dinner table, we all know the most effective stories are ones that come in some ways from personal experience. And that's the motto I always use. How would you tell a story if you were sitting at the dinner table talking to different people? There's different audiences, they have different interests, they have different things they'll find funny, different things they'll find sad. But how do you draw that line to where you will be telling your most effective version of the story that you have been tasked to tell? And I think leaning into those experiences is something conceptually that I've, I've had to work on. I'm continually working on it, but at least it's, it's, it's an acknowledgement that, that I don't think was as much there before the process as it is now. Kendall, do you agree with that? Do you see that in your own work and in the work of reporters that you're working with as well? Yeah, I think there's a lot of conversations that are being had, um, you know, big and small. Um, you know, in my new role, I, I get a lot of, um, there's just been a lot of talk. People have been able to sort of, um, I feel like there's more space to have conversations that we weren't having before. I think people are feeling a little bit more free to talk about, talk about their biases, talk about, um, uh, talk about the lens at which they look through things and then asking questions. Um, I probably, you know, as a photographer, I, I, I would see, uh, read people's stories before they're reading, at, for their uh, hit the pages. But now I've been reading a lot of people's stories to just check their work, to make sure that they feel like um, the, the work that they're producing and the voices that they've gathered and, and put together feel authentic. And um, so that to me is really encouraging. Um, also too, just to be able to, um, I, I think, you know, just as um, just as CNN has done, and we, we've uh, created a race team too. Um, and it's and it's that idea of making sure that it's not just the race team that's doing that type of work, that everybody is using their lenses to take a look and see difference. Like, you know, if you're doing a school story, have diversity in sources and not just um, having it be like a particular race story that everybody should be doing a source edit and taking a look at who they're talking to regularly and making sure that reaches a wide range of people and a wide range of communities. Danny, can you talk about this from your research perspective? There's something qualitatively different about how, um, newsrooms cover racial justice, it seems, than other social issues. There's asymmetry that we just discussed whenever there is a crime story or much, much as there is asymmetry when there's a military story. And, and really in, in Minneapolis, we really kind of had both once the, the National Guard came in in some ways. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your research and, and kind of some of the differences in this type of coverage and how um, race matters and, and becomes uh, salient um, in coverage of violence and, um, and crime uh, in, in the context of social movements and why that matters. Sure. I, I mean, 
race is covered differently in almost all topics. So um, while I obsess over protests, I mean, we can look at differences in the opioid crisis. You can look at differences in COVID and how things are, are, um, are covered. But in terms of protest, uh, most of my research basically shows that like, people protesting immigration laws or gun violence or, you know, women's rights um, or protesting for women's rights. These protests, protests just aren't covered in the same way. They, each of these will have their own sensational aspects. They um, will, you know, have hats that are sewn for a specific reason or, uh, you know, there will be a bunch of kids and we will <laughs> talk about how young these protesters are, whatever it is, there'll be, there'll be differences in what that protest looks like. But for anti-racism protests, it's just, it's also quailed with this history of, um, a long history of uh, pro depicting protesters as violence that sort of sort of carries through and makes words more salient, makes presence, um, makes the pictures and and the descriptions so much more obvious to people and to audiences. Um, so anti-black racism uh, protests, especially and anti-indigenous racism protests, are usually portrayed more often at the forefront as more disruptive, more confrontatious, um, and then more including more violence on a regular basis. Um, and I think a lot of people are tempted to say, well, they are. But in the end, that's not true because protests at their heart are meant to be disruptive. And they are. Like the Women's March fills the downtown area. You know, I mean, there's these are marches unlike we've ever seen before. Um, and they don't all have permits. And there almost always is police presence at a, at a protest. It's whether or not you see it or not and, and whether or not it's emphasized in coverage. And I think, you know, because also police treat um, or react to these protesters in different ways, um, it's easy to sort of be blinded by police presence in other places, but they, but they are there. And so my research really, really just sort of draws out this, how often do you call Black Lives Matter protests, for example, riotous versus um, something like anti-Trump protest or the NFL protest or, um, or the Women's March protests? Um, and how often do you also sort of combat that with including their demands and their agendas and the reasons why the protesters are there in the first place? Because protesters don't get paid uh, <laughs> for the most part. Um, so how often is that balanced? And, and for Black Lives Matter um, protests and for anti-Indigenous racism protests, like we saw at the Dakota Pipeline, we just don't see enough of their voices and their grievances and, and their struggle in that coverage. We see a lot more attention to the violence and the and the um, and the disruption, and I think it's problematic because it feeds back into these bigger negative stereotypes um, that end up oppressing these communities um, and that remain ingrained in people's heads no matter how much we push back against the, against them. I think one of the most um, problematic things is most journalists want to like create something and then they want it to immediately make everything better. And I think, you know, we've got centuries to go before we're going to get racist thoughts out of people's heads. However, like it's just this, it's just gotta be a slow moving process to get better um, and to stop critiquing sort of the same, the same wheel in the same way. Do others have thoughts um, to add on this? Um, and I'll just give you one more, uh, one more question to think about. Um, a student journalist um, just wrote a Q&A for us that says, as a student journalist, we're taught to be objective, but what does that mean when covering racial justice and racism? You know, what do you say to that? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a really, really good question. Now, now this idea of, of objectivity, of, of analyzing what the story is and trying to figure out what stories best represent this story is not going anywhere. So if, if that's the definition of objectivity, that always needs to be a part of your reporting. Because again, you are trying to tell this story, not just to your friends, you're telling this to an audience of people who might not have the context that you do. So that's what objectivity means at its base. You know, if you're a student going to the world, how can you get sources that represent the story the best? Um, part of what I was talking about earlier is now that you're starting from here, how do you go about this process? What voices do you think matter the most to tell this story in a complete way? Now, um, uh, Danny and Kendall both talked about sometimes a reliance in the media to um, to go to official sources. You know, police uh, 
uh, the mayor's office, things like that. People who are holding press conferences, probably the best way to say it. Well, if you're doing that and you've noticed that, and maybe you're someone who comes from a background who has recognized that and feels that community voices have been overshadowed. Maybe when you go into that story, you say, all right, I'll include the police in this, but I'll also make sure to include the you know, community leader, the guy who runs the YMCA, the guy who's been out in the streets protesting with people. And just having that intuition, you would be surprised, not everybody does. Because some people come into that same objectivity um, question where I'm gonna tell the story with the uh, right amount of sources to do this the right way. But they might've come from a background where they grew up trusting police, where they grew up trusting their mayor, where they grew up taking their officials' words at the surface. And so inherently you will have two sets of people go into the same set of circumstances and tell two slightly different stories that might not be incorrect factually, but one, in my opinion, is less complete than the other if you're not acknowledging, um, you know, in this case, community voices versus, versus police. Other thoughts on this, Kendall? Any advice for the student on how to think um, think about this concern over objectivity while really, um, you know, improving kind of the practice of covering racial justice and racism? Yeah, I think Omar pretty much wrapped it up. Um, you really do have to. Um, I like fairness over the word objectivity. I think you just want to do the the best, most complete job of of telling that story. And I think the question is always like, whose voice am I not hearing? If I step in a room or think about a story and I'm reading it over again, whose voice is not here? Who should be here? Um, you know, um, especially when you're dealing with communities. Um, I think that we get to a point where, where a lot of um, those press conferences, it's so easy to just take the words of the people who stand in front of the podium and go with it. Um, it, is, it is the default. It is the, the, the road well-traveled and it's hard to go that extra mile, to make that extra call on deadline, to get the people in communities that you may not be a part of. I mean, that's hard, that's hard work, but it's so worthwhile because it is exactly what journalists do. We, we go in difficult places, um, ask hard questions, and, um, and, and then sh we're supposed to be the mirror to our communities. And when we don't have different people in the building reflecting, and if we are not careful about reaching out to communities who are not like us, um, then we're not doing a good job of being a mirror to, to our communities. And being, the, being that we are supposed to be the first draft of history, um, what are our kids going to read, right? How are we representing us? Um, it's important. It's important work that we get this right. I want to um, bring in a comment and a question from um, Professor Jane Kirtley, who's our Silha professor and an expert in uh, media ethics and also the law. And she says that I absolutely agree with the idea of looking for diverse viewpoints and sources, but isn't one of the factors that prompts journalists to go to police for official statements, the libel laws. You are insulated under fair report privilege for quoting official statements accurately. You're not for reporting statements of activists or other non-official sources. How does that influence um, your work or, or is that something that you, you've thought about? Uh, yeah, I, I can jump in on this one as um, covering at the local. I used to work locally in Baltimore and then um, obviously here in Chicago as well. I think that becomes a difficulty, right? In the beginning, especially at the beginning, 
once something happens and you're just looking for whatever's happening, usually the first person to give you information as you're showing up to a scene is you're getting it through a police press release or a police press conference. And so in the beginning, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that that is that is the crutch and that is why it's so difficult because you as a reporter feel like I have to get something out there, but I all I have at the moment is a set of circumstances and maybe some cell phone video from witnesses. Um, where I think once you're actually there and you're starting to dig into the story, you now can start putting both of those things side by side. Um, for example, what was difficult in the uh, Jacob Blake shooting in Kenosha, where I also covered, was in the early portions of, um, of I guess the protests had happened, but in the early portions of, of the beginning of the litigation, um, we had that cell phone video of him coming around the car, but the Kenosha Police Association was saying he absolutely had a knife, while his lawyers are saying, uh, Jacob Blake's lawyers are saying he absolutely did not have a knife, and community members are saying it doesn't matter if he had a knife, he shouldn't have been shot like that. And so just the ability in those situations where it really you weren't there and you don't know exactly what happened, the best you can do is try to represent as many voices um, to at least get to wherever the truth is. It's, it's usually in, in the midway point of all of those voices. In those situations, it's, you just have to bring as many voices to the table um, that, you know, that, that you believe are newsworthy and try to get to the truth that is again, somewhere snaked in there. But, um, and the other thing I'll say on, on that um, and, and why it's so important that we do that is because I think we've seen time and time again that, that police reports and police statements aren't always what the story actually is. I mean, you think about the George Floyd story, if we didn't have that cell phone video of him literally screaming that he can't breathe under Derek Chauvin's knee, all we'd have is a police report filed by those officers. We'd have maybe a few witness statements that like, it, if there was no big spark, how would we even know to go to these witnesses unless you're already entrenched in these communities? And the only way this might have ever popped up is if some reporter had an intuition that this feels weird, let me FOIA this police report and see if there's anything I can find. The fact that we had this video directly refutes the police report that came out at the time. Even when I got arrested on live television, the state patrol put out a tweet a few minutes later saying, oh, we had to verify that he was a journalist while the whole world was watching. So I think those two examples right off the bat show that yes, police can't always be trusted. The tough reality though is they often in the beginning control the narrative of what comes out. And that's where our jobs as reporters come in to try and get past that narrative and get you the readers or viewers what the truth actually is. I think that's often um, been the case where the video um, evidence really has been, been what has sustained a conversation um, where there has been sustained news media conversation. We have a question from um, one of our student journalists um, from The Daily, uh, Jasmine Snow, and she asks, what have you all found to be good and effective balance in protest activism coverage framing, capturing the human impact while not infantilizing activists in their work, focusing on the intricacies of protest goals while keeping the story interesting, for lack of a better word, capturing the full scope of what a protest covers while also being succinct. Any tips or things that you all think about? Kendall? Yeah, I would say like, um, I think it's really important to, uh, to step back a little bit. So when you're at a protest and it's easy to get caught up in it and in the movement of, of things and, um, uh, but to really, step back and and look at the people and see the people for who they are and and I tend to I said I used to used to tend to go on the edges and have conversations with the people who are also watching and um, the support people 
Um, I'm one of those folks who, who, who loves to talk up the elevator person or the security guard or whoever, but there are always people, even in protests, who can give you perspective. Um, I, the, the one thing that always fan, um, fascinated me was that there's, there's that divide between the, there's always, sometimes there's this element of people who are just angry, um, who are in there as well as the folks who are there to show themselves and be, um, you know, quote unquote, peaceful protesters. And there's always, there's always a moment during that piece, especially between, between night, uh, between day and night, where, um, where there's almost a, like almost a disagreement between how things should go from here. And, and I think there is, there is one article that we did where we talked, um, there was definitely one picture, another rich song picture, that we talked about that sort of conflict about, not necessarily conflict with each other about what needs to be done, but how. Um, and I always thought over time that that, that piece was fascinating, um, just that, that protesting is not a monolith and we shouldn't treat it as such. There is intricacies, um, how it flows, who's there as the protectors, what are they protecting? Um, there's so many different roles in that larger group um, that I feel uh, doesn't get the, uh, the treatment that it should. Um, because it's not, it, you know, there are so many people coming for so many different reasons and having, spending the time and having those conversations in and around as, as we move, as we walk, I, I think is really crucial. And I just want to add, I think mapping out who those voices could be in advance, like we know these protests will happen again, and we know something is going to, so mapping out who those official sources on that non-official side is going to be is really important. So, you know, look at the people who are head, are still talking about Black Lives Matter and still connected online, but also look towards like the AME church and the Black pastors and what they're saying and look towards, you know, other sort of nonprofit organizations or, or key leaders that aren't in government that can help sort of give you different different aspects of how protesters are going to come at this right their story their grievance is newsworthy right and, and and people need to hear it over and over and over again so it's not for lack of newsworthiness i think it's just trying to figure out where where you can capture it amidst like something that feels very chaotic for a journalist and i think one of the really great things you can do is map out those official sources uh, as much as you can in advance so that you can find them when you're on the ground um, a couple of questions um, that I'm going to combine, um, you know, from our audience members from an anonymous uh, submissions. Um, Omar, um, someone wants to know what was going through your mind when you were arrested. Um, but I also wanted to ask the question of sustainability. Both you and Kindle have talked about changes made, um, creating race teams, hiring more representative staff, thinking a little bit um, in retrospect about how this coverage will emerge with the understanding that this there there's really just at the beginning of a process of um, grievances around social justice justice policing etc that are are going to continue uh, until they're addressed right um so um can you talk a little bit more about what was going through your mind and in your thoughts on the sustainability of it and how you see yourself sustaining the work too because as a journalist this this takes a toll right um yeah, yeah, I, I think um, uh, I'll I'll handle the the arrest one first. I mean, uh, that morning, and I, th I think it was even apparent on what made it on TV was. I mean, we did not think under any circumstances that our live reporting would end in us being cuffed. Um, I mean, we were out of the way of police. We kept asking them, "Where do you want us to go?" And um, they. The, the interesting thing with that was there was never any communication in any way. They literally just stood there. I'm sure someone was talking in their ear because then all of a sudden, without warning, without uh, an all in unison, 
the first words I heard from them were, you're under arrest. And I think as I look back and reflect on that, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we were detained for an hour, 30 minutes. Um, it, it wasn't great, but we, we were okay. We were physically okay, which was important. Um, but there were a few things that stick out. One was from that moment that, uh, as I reflect back, that idea of no communication, but then moving into action seemed to me like a metaphor of what the relationship of police and community has been for so long, that, that no one was listening. I was clearly saying like, we don't have to do this. Just tell me what you want. I, I want to work with you here. And that just being ignored and them staying like robots on their agenda. And so again, as I look back, that is a metaphor that I pull out um, as, as one that's significant. The other I kind of alluded to before this idea of, um, of accountability. If, if the cameras weren't rolling, my word of what happened would have been up against their word in the tweet they put out or whatever, they could have said I was resisting. They could have said I was violent. They could have said I, you name it. But I luckily had this out of being on live television when that happened, when we know 99.9% .9 of these interactions don't happen on live television, much less even by a camera. And that's what ends up being the situation where you go off those police reports, you go off those police press conferences, and I bet you that a lot of the times the story isn't quite what the police have put out because there just didn't happen to be a camera there. So those are the things I think about when it comes to the arrest. Um, in regards to the sustainability of, of these teams that have been created, look, there's no way to really know, but I think the best thing that we can do is use this moment to prove that these teams and these investments are worth it. Because even though we know it's worth it, there are a lot of people in the media industry or otherwise who, I mean, let's just be honest, probably view this as like a, oh, that's a race thing. That's just a racial thing. Like, that'll be fine. Well, the language that everybody seems to be able to speak is, is, is money and audience and, and impact on society. And so I just had the mentality of, okay, you wanna give us this stage, you wanna give us this opportunity, this platform, let's show you and the world the impact of what stories from these communities can actually create. Because we have the attention of the world. We have the attention of some of the most powerful media executives and industry executives on the planet. Even if it is white guilt right now, I'll take it. I'll take it if it just gets us in the door to tell some of these stories. And for me personally, I don't worry about sustainability because at the end of the day, I'm a national correspondent. I get caught up in all types of stories. But at the end of the day, these are stories that are an extension of who I am. Even if what's happening in the headline isn't happening to me in the moment, I'm still a black man. I'm still a Latino man. There are certain things that happen and I can't help thinking about because it's who I am. So I'm not worried about the sustainability of me. Even if I get distracted, I'm always going to come back to this idea of who didn't I talk to? Why didn't I tell this story in a way that represents me like it does this community? So I'm not worried about me, but Again, this is a moment that we need to really take advantage of and push forward with the momentum that I believe is still in the air and in the industry. Kendall, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I mean, the, the question of sustaining the work. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, you know, sustainability is a, um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sustainability is a real yeah sometimes i'm popular okay here we go <laughs> um it's a it's a real it's a real thing um um uh, i think that what we i think we don't know how this is going to play out i mean we can, we can hope that we've got enough momentum. I mean, it feels like it. It feels like there's enough people in the room, enough people who have awakened and feel like things need to change and are motivated for change at this point. But, you know, at the executive level, level we just don't know how sustainable that is. Um, but um, like Omar was saying, I, I always love to point to the money. 
right? I, I feel like journalism as an industry, well, there are a lot of industries who have overlooked this, but journalism as an industry has sort of what I feel like has left money on the table in terms of communities. Um, here are people, groups of people we surfacely cover. If we actually um, covered them with the complexity that we do um, our white colleagues and our, our white neighbors, um, I think the investment that they would have in us if they actually trusted us to tell their story correctly uh, would be immense. As we know, you know, as the census goes, um, you know, the minority is becoming the majority. So if we're not careful about um, not necessarily catering to, but being responsible for and showing and being a mirror to these communities, then it's just like, we're not doing our job in terms of um, our own sustainability, right? So I just feel like, again, like I feel like as, as uh, news organizations, we tend to leave money on the table when it comes to communities of color and not really showing them themselves in a way that they want to invest in us. Because, you know, right now I keep on telling people like communities of color don't need us. They don't really need us in the sense that um, they have other avenues to get their information from. Um, but so it's, it's us who need them. We need to come and be, um, uh, to be real and authentic and really be able to show their story in a way that we haven't done that before. Oh, here we go again. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So what, um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of ownership. Um, uh, and there's a question from Chris Terry, um, another faculty in the school, um, who asked, what does the relative lack of minority owned media outlets, certainly at the local level, play in the larger issues of this discussion? Minority voices have been artificially limited by changes to ownership structures, especially at the local level. And I, I've also kind of put a different spin on this. We've talked a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, the dominant narrative from CNN for even our large general audience newspapers, but that's certainly not the Minneapolis news media scene, right? We have a, actually a, a quite a rich and, and varied group of um, community newspapers, um, black newspapers, uh, uh, you know, ethnic media, radio, um, and even broader, this story wasn't just a national story. We had Spanish language media, um, you know, really journalism from around the world interested in understanding how the story translated and could help them understand both our politics, but also our uh, relationships between um, police and communities of color. So um, for you, how does media ownership factor into this? And anyone can start with this. I don't know, Danny, um, I think we haven't heard from you in a while. Why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, sort of to, to get at Chris's question at the beginning, I mean, I think that like the black press plays an incredibly important role in providing a perspective that cannot or is not provided at this time in the mainstream media that's you know, front, front and center. Um, and they've always done that to plead their own cause, right? Um, and I think that, you know, other alternative activist ethnic media sources do the same thing. They provide a different narrative and they don't necessarily like defy objectivity. They just say, I think um, the best way to say this is they, they promote comforting the afflicted <laughs> much more than they promote standard journalistic practices. And I think that their voices are important. I think what they push out to communities represents them. I think that many, um, in many of the surveys that I've done with uh, minority communities, those are the places that they went that they trusted because those p particular places made them visible. They made them feel like they were there and they don't have to build against a you know centuries long narrative of being oppressed by them. 
So I think they play a really, an incredibly important part in, in bringing diversity to a media field that's needed. Uh, the mainstream press cannot do everything. There is no way in the world we could expect journalists to tell us the Bible of an event, right? But they, I think that they provide a really essential part of um, getting at what the reality is uh, of a particular situation and getting those those voices on the ground that maybe journalists don't have access to. I mean, one of the problems that journalists faced during the protest um, that I've talked to is that they didn't have access to protesters for a while. Protesters don't want to talk to them anymore. <laughs> um, and I think that you know, alternative media like Unicorn Riot don't—they don't have that problem here in in the cities because they they sent they put protesters front and center. They they use them as their central official sources, right? And so I think that you know these uh, these other kinds of media that reimagine. Um, and yes, you know, a lot of them are struggling, but they also don't necessarily use the same business models. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, they, they play an essential role in, in promoting diversity of thought um, in, in the media landscape. Hey, I'd like to add to that too. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Danny. Like, I feel like if, um, that that diversity of thought and having multiple voices um, is so important in terms of like the rich landscape that people, just a rich landscape of information for people to, um, um, to have. Um, you know, like the Hmong news is vital to, um, uh, to communities to, to be able to get that information out um, and yeah, we can't, you know, uh, mainstream media can't do it themselves. We need to be, um, you know, again, sort of like learning, um, learning from each other, I think is probably, um, uh, what should be happening and, um, being able to, um, I, I always believe in competition being uh, a really strong um, way to sort of drive people and um, and just to, you know that sort of that healthy competition but also to be able to you know um, see each other's stories and then be able to share them in a real way um, I, I think is also important uh, yeah I'll just say that it was, it was just like yes <laughs> yes we need all of them all the voices, all the voices are important. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll add in there that, um, I mean, as someone who, you know, mainstream media at the national level um, at that, which makes it even more difficult sometimes to come in. And basically we parachute into these situations and we're expected to all of a sudden have this deep rooted understanding of a community and know all the, people that have lived there for 30 years and you know so it becomes all that more difficult to take the time you know to to pitch that to your manager and say look I need like just an hour let me just make some calls let me just try and figure out who the hell I need to talk to here um, and one thing that I think has changed and has been great about this is that we talk about you know ownership and how much that matters um, I can't speak to the business side of things, but I can speak to what trickles down to someone like me who's actually out on the ground is that I do feel a lot more confident um, in, in asking for those things. I feel a lot more confident in saying that, hey, I don't think we can push the story out unless we talk to X, Y, Z. Um, and feeling comfortable enough that my superiors aren't going to bulldoze me. And uh, sometimes it still happens, but that's just the nature of the game. But feel confident that they're not going to all the time bulldoze me and at least be receptive to what I'm actually saying makes a huge difference. And I don't know if beforehand, I, I just wasn't thinking in these terms and maybe they weren't either, but I do feel like because this conversation became, or because this event sparked this national conversation, this national reckoning of sorts, Everybody or a lot of people seem to be on, even if they're not on the same page, they're in the same chapter, you know? And so you can at least feel a little bit more comfortable approaching some of these topics. And, and that matters um, a lot to me. If I didn't have that confidence, I think my confidence would, again, 
be a little bit more shot, knowing that there is a higher hurdle to jump to bring some of these perspectives into stories. Um, there's a question from Kathleen Allen that it, she says, it's a question really about research and the time that you have to prepare, um, which, uh, and it's defund the police as an example and idea that requires some journalistic research and analysis regarding the implications and how this would actually work. And what's been so fascinating for me, I'm, I'm from Louisville, I've, I watched the Brianna Taylor situation, uh, others, um, you know, what's happened in Minneapolis in terms of its city council's serious conversation around police funding, I think is really remarkably different than what's serious, than what's really going on um, across the country in the sense that I think that um, this, the George Floyd protests have sparked a very serious conversation around funding and resources and how police works. And so the question from Kathleen Allen is, do you get time to do this research? Is it encouraged? Because this might be a different conversation going on differently in different cities. Um, for, there are some contours of the Minneapolis situation that I think are, are unique, for example, that I think um, that, that have come out in our local coverage. Um, so how does that work for, for your newsrooms? Um, maybe Omar and, and Kendall? Yeah, I, I think um, it's it's difficult um, because a lot of times in these scenarios, I am deployed last minute. Um, I remember actually the morning of, uh, or this was actually the day after um, George Floyd had been killed, the cell phone video had circulated that Tuesday or that next morning, I think it was a Tuesday. Um, I was told at eight in the morning, hey, get to Minneapolis right now. And because of COVID, there weren't that many flights. The last flight left in 30 minutes, so I was driving. And so basically, I drove for six hours from Chicago, stepped out of the car, and 10 minutes later was in front of the camera. And so, you know, I'm trying to read email, but I'm also trying to be safe. I'm trying to be a safe driver. Um, and I'm trying to like listen to the radio and listen to what, you know, just trying to contextualize as much as I possibly can because when I get there, now it's go, go, go. Now I will say the first night I'm at a scene, because again, we typically parachute in, usually is like a deep breath moment of like, okay, what exactly is this story? What, what is it going to be? What are some, sort of the contextual things that we can add to this? And that is where like the research for, for defund the police would come in. I mean, obviously this to me was a concept where it, it didn't require too much research just because I felt like I had been in some of these communities and I had heard similar sentiments. So I wasn't completely blown away by the idea of it. I honestly think the biggest thing that, that we had to tackle in it was if defund the police was, was the motto and was the narrative, inevitably I'm gonna have to say that on TV, but now I have to make sure I add the context of wait, this doesn't mean take all money away from police officers. This means reinvesting money into different parts of the, of the community so that you're not so reliant on policing. Now I'm very conscious of that. And I actually think that's the more difficult part of when can you just sort of flippantly say defund the police or, or, or move past a complicated topic just quickly? And when do you feel you have the opportunity to well, like, I can't just like, skim past, I need to find a way to sort of work in some, some necessary context here. I think defunding the police is a good example, um, but there are a lot of times where you, you're just, as a reporter, you also have a limited time on television or in an article, and you are constantly weighing how often can I skip over this, this complicated topic that is deserve it, deserving of its own conversation um, until I start, until it becomes a disservice to then the reader or viewer that's that's watching. And so I think that's the more difficult part of this for me. Yeah, I think it's the it's that daily work versus enterprise, right? Um, you you have the thing that you need to cover that's in front of you. And um, there's that need for a sort of constant updating of the website to make sure that you're uh, you're feeding out your competitors or what have you, or, um, but there's also, you know, when is the time to step back and do that research and do that, you know, that special, that, that enterprise work uh, that's, uh, that's necessary. Um, I mean, I think that 
um, I think we're fortunate that we've got some um, um, data journalists at the at the Strib that can can take that burden away from some of the reporters and sort of help them um, figure out scope. Um, once we once we sort of like figure out what that target is, um, but yeah, it's that it's that balance that I think every single reporter at the Star Tribune would say that that's their one of their biggest um, um, tug of war situations for themselves is is like how do you get off the hamster wheel to tell the story that you really feel like people need to have more information about and when does that happen? Um, uh, you know, we don't always get it right. Um, sometimes it's too late, sometimes it's too early and we don't have enough voices in it. Um, but it's a, it's a constant um, push and pull of, uh, of that daily reporting enterprise piece. It's a tough one. I saved a really important question for, for last that came in from an anonymous um, attendee. Um, we have about 10, 11 more minutes left. And the question is, what do the panelists think local media can do to repair harm with BIPOC communities? What role can an institution like the University of Minnesota and the journalism school also play? The tensions between media and communities of color have been simmering for a long time, especially in the Twin Cities with much trauma experienced and very little trust as a result. What is can be done in repairing that harm? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start in terms of the institution like the University of Minnesota and the journalism school. I mean, I think that for at, at the very beginning, um, you know, at the fundamental to who we are is we, we not only wanna be an institution and a school that reflects the community, but we also have a role to kind of educate and engage with communities and a variety of communities. So in terms of what the journalism school's done, you know, we've been trying to um, reach and engage as many different communities as we can through our internship programs, through our hiring um, of professionals that come in and work in the school and others. And um, we also have been working um, to figure this out with our students because um, although we have a hundred year history, it's not the case that all students have been an equal opportunity to be admitted to the journalism school for a hundred years. And we understand that um, we actually have a project underway in which we are um, reaching out to our students to, um, to help understand what their needs are, particularly our students of color. Um, an institution like the Min University of Minnesota, is, it's a huge institution. 50,000 plus people. So um, there isn't just one way that we're doing it, but, um, but, but we're working on that. And I really encourage anyone that's listening that has ideas about this um, to let me know and to reach out because um, that's the best way when you know more, when you, you try to do better. And so that's, that's um, what we try to do with, with our strategic plan um, and, and the work that we do. For the local media, um, I think it's a, it's a similar situation and a, and a, and a really broad question. So um, I'll start with, um, with um, whoever would like to start really in terms of <laughs> all of you go, have turned off your microphones right at the same time. So, um, but what, what do you think that we can do more of to repair heart and to gain trust? Hey, Danny, you, did you wanna say something? I felt like you were about to piggyback off of Elisa. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I can I, it, yeah, I have something to say, but you're more than welcome to go first. I accidentally clicked my unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's a long um, day. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that, um, I think the biggest key is to, um, be humble and listen. Like, I think that we need to spend time with communities, um, listen to what they said, and then actually act on it. Like come up with strategies and plans around um, uh, what they're doing and, um, and the, um, the suggestions that they have for us. Uh, and, and, um, and then watch us grow and keep on going back and continue the conversation. Um, I think that, you know, 
as news journalists, um, a lot of what we do feels very transactional. We go into a community, we take a story, and then we, um, you know, display th their words um, uh, in our products, right? So that feels very transactional, it's very taking. And I think that um, we need to get out of the mode of taking and um, get into a mode of sitting and listening and giving. And we need to not just give them what we think they should have, but we need to ask what they need from us. Um, and, uh, and then spending the time and then, then actually make relationships that you're not always taking from and um, uh, um, being, and being just open to the criticism. I think a lot of times we, we tend to, um, um, to sort of rear back because it's hard to hear. It's hard that you, to hear that you haven't been seeing me for the last 150 years, right? Of your, of your existence. So um, I think uh, being humble and being, uh, and being active listeners and building relationships over time that mean something to both parties, um, I think is key. Um, and it's, it's, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and there are going to be missteps along the way. There just can't not be because humans, right? Um, but if there's a willingness to be authentic, um, I think that there's, there's a chance at, re at, at actually repairing things. Now, I will second all of that. <laughs> um, and, I, and I also just want to share a resource. I worked on a project this summer that, um, that had, I, uh, did 30 personal interviews with Black Americans and 1,000 um, Black survey respondents um, that just has like, what are the problems? Journalists recognizing what are the problems that are, that are really um, a part of this trust issue. Um, and it also has sort of what are the, what, what are some solutions? Not, not my solutions either, like a thousand, <laughs> a thousand survey respondent solutions sort of condensed into one little digestible white paper report. And it may just be useful to, to look at it. And I know some of the highlights um, and some of the things um, that, that came out of it for me was, you know, finding black joy not just going to, to certain communities when problems are there, <laughs> being engaged in those communities on a regular basis and seeing the, you know, the complexities of their life, um, providing a more complete story. I mean, people are always going to think that the story, the whole story isn't there. The journalists, you can't put the whole story out there. I've already discussed that, but, <laughs> but they would like to see themselves represented in the coverage. Um, and they would like to see a diversified version of them, not the same people, not one kind of person, not just one person per story, you know, multiple, uh, multiple, just, just bring some nuance to, um, to what it means to be black, to what it means to be a black person, to what it means to be a person of color. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I found most fascinating about that report is how, or about doing that research was how aware um, people were that there were very few black journalists. <laughs> I was like, wow, we have really said hire black journalists a lot. <laughs> they heard us and they know they're not, they know that there aren't journalists there to represent them. They, they have trouble finding journalists in their communities already. Um, but they also know there aren't enough journalists to represent them. And so I think that that's, that's such a big one. Hire black journalists, hire black editors. Um, I think it's such a huge, a huge way to build trust with those communities. And one thing I'll add quickly before we end here is, I mean, coming from, from the national scope, obviously it's an issue that, that, that we've seen plagued across national media for a long time, this idea of representation. And um, Danny put it perfectly for what I was gonna say in the sense of people wanna see themselves in the coverage and they don't wanna see a monolith of, they don't wanna see a stereotype. They don't want me to only put black people on TV when I'm covering a shooting on the South side of Chicago. And I actually, that's something that I've taken personally. It didn't take Chicago for me to learn that. It took when I was a local reporter in Baltimore, it took me to learn that. In that I realized I was just kind of, you know, I was a young reporter or whatever. I realized I was kind of falling into that trap 
of relying on police reports, of interviewing, trying to interview victims and whatever, but realizing I'm only showing black people when, I'm only talking to black people when it comes to problems in their community. And now that I'm here in Chicago, especially on the national scale, I take it very seriously that I represent this city. What I put on TV represents this. So what am I going to show? Of course, there's violence that's affecting largely black communities. But I've also made an effort that when I do COVID stories, I talk to black doctors, I talk to Latino doctors. Um, I mean, we fortunately have, in this case, we have a black mayor here. So whenever I talk to the mayor, there is that face on TV. The normal everyday stories that show that black and Latino people and Asian and other minorities, they are normal Americans, people too, who live in large part great normal lives with their families. Are there tragedies that happen? Of course, but I, tr tr I try, and I think this will help with you know repairing any damage that is, I try not to let that be the only story that's told or the only reason I end up knocking on your door, especially with the megaphone that we have of CNN, knowing that I'm not just representing Chicago to the United States, I'm representing the United States and a culture of people to the entire world. And that's a concept I carry with me every time I step into a story. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. I know the days right now are long for all of us. And I always go um, first to the local too, to who's available, but diversifying our speakers um, in the school, as well as gaining the right people who can, um, who have expertise to talk about a given issue um, from a variety of perspectives has always been very important. So I really appreciate your willingness um, to, to talk tonight. Um, I hope that we can have each of you back perhaps after the trial to kind of reflect on what comes, what, what was hard to cover, what, what worked well um, along with others that, that we missed tonight. Um, and I wish you guys all the best in your careers and in your good work. And please do let me know if there's something that I or the school um, can do to be of help in the future. Thank you to our audience members for submitting such wonderful questions. There are a few that we haven't gotten to. Um, I tried to pick the ones that were most germane to the topic. Um, if you do have questions that you would like um, to send me and follow up, my email is ecohen at umn.edu. I will try to get them responded to. Um, but for now, we're gonna say good night and thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it.